Amen. Thank you for praying with me, for uniting your heart with me. So with that, let's go ahead and look at the word of the Spirit in his word. So go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and there you will find the Ten Commandments. We are almost done with the Ten Commandments. We've been doing a countdown, if you remember. Uh, Countdowns go from the best, or the, not the least, to the best, but uh, from important to very important. So we're coming now to the first commandment. So as you turn there, we'll also have it on the screen for you, and then we'll pray and ask for God's help to understand this and apply this together. So this is the word of God from the book of Exodus for you this morning, chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's pray. Father, give us your understanding, not just so we can know more, but so that we can praise you more, so that we can act in a way that honors you. So Father, Son, and Spirit, we ask that you would dwell with us in your word this morning. Amen. So this is a pretty simple one-line commandment. If I asked you right now to raise your hand, if you know the commandments, would you be able to at least get the first one? Probably. Raise your hand internally spiritually, raise your spiritual hands, uh, would you be able to write out this commandment? It's probably one of the most well-known because it's the first. And we always start with the first and then peter out halfway through. But we have the first commandment here. You shall have no other gods before me. What does it mean? Uh, But more helpfully, what does it mean to us today? And how do we actually live that out? Do you know what it is, is the first question, but we've just read it. And so do you know what it means and how to live it out? So we're just going to look through that today together. It's pretty simple. So turn with me to this verse. What does it mean? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Pretty simple, right? On its face of it, don't worship any other gods besides Yahweh, besides our God. So it is against polytheism, multiple gods, and it is for monotheism, one God, the God, the true God. It's a pretty bold statement that this is the one true God, but he's making it. Don't worship any other God, have no other God before me. So that's kind of the negative phrase phraseology of it. The positive one is this, the way it's put in Deuteronomy 6. So you've heard this, but listen to it again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. So that is this statement. That's what the first commandment is, is to love the Lord. And so it breaks our understanding of the word love out of this sentimental, emotional category only and puts it into exclusive loyalty. What does the first commandment command us? To have exclusive loyalty to God. So that's what it, that's what it means, But we have difficulty today in our context uh, understanding the the weight of that, the weight of that, because we live in a a, a mono-religious world when most people on earth live in a poly-religious world. So do you understand what I'm saying? Mono and poly, poly means many, mono means one. You know that. We live in a poly context. And the people back then, when this was written, lived in a poly context. And what that means is, in terms of religious, of of deities, anything religious or relating to deities went into the poly category. There were many of them, and that was fine. They couldn't actually think of 
there being one and only exclusive God. So if I were to give you an example today of what the poly category looks and feels like, it would be the category of supermarkets. I don't know if anyone uses that term anymore, but supermarkets. This is a poly category. What this means is Harris Teeter cannot demand your exclusive shopping loyalty. They have a loyalty program where you can save money if you buy from them. And they call it a loyalty card or program, but they can't demand it. And in fact, we want competition, right? We want Aldi to come in and say, hey, I'll, if you get your own cart for a quarter, I will, uh, I'll charge you less for your groceries. And we think, wow, okay. And so we go there, but then they don't have everything you need all the time. And so you have to go to somewhere else to find it. If you're looking for really specialty stuff, you have to drive up to Whole Foods. So there's different categories. There's different places where you can go and get what you need. That's a poly world. That's not a mono world. And so that's what the context of God's people and the people back then were living in, in terms of God and religion. If you needed something, you went to the, the God or the place, the source that was most convenient or most available to have what you needed. And so if you needed uh, to have a job or to have a family, you would go to one God. If you needed to win in war, you would go to the God of war. It, it was normal. It was seen as totally uh, normal as going to a supermarket was or is today. So that's the context of a polytheistic worldview. That's what they had. We have, there are very few examples that we have today of a mono worldview. And the ones that I can give you is this. A business non-compete contract. If you work in a business, maybe a hospital, some of you remember that kind of Situation with Atrium and uh, Novant of non-compete contracts and layoffs, and you couldn't go work somewhere else because you'd signed a contract saying, I will work for you and you alone. And I can't go and jump in a poly context to another healthcare center, especially if you're in research and development. You can't take all that year, all those years of research and development and then just shift sides and go and work for another company and share and bring all of that that you bring. So there's a non-compete contract that is in the mono category. The other aspect would be marriage. Marriage is like a mono category, mostly today. It's probably going to change soon. And if you live in Utah, it's not totally there as a mono category. But marriage is a mono category too. What this commandment is saying to us this morning is that God sees religion and himself in a mono category, not a poly category. The people of God and the, the context that they lived in, you could have a highest God with other gods. God is saying, I am the only God. You shall have no other God before me. And one of the ways that we know he means that is this. So there's a scholar, um, his name is Meredith Klein, and he's pretty well known for his research in the area of the ancient Near East and how they did treaties. They basically found uh, in archaeology a bunch of these treaties uh, from hundred, well, thousands of years ago, so 1300 BC, they found essentially legal documents. And when they read them and said, what are all these legal documents that we found in the desert sands? They saw contracts, non-compete contracts, mono-contracts between a king and his people. And interestingly, these contracts between an actual king and his actual people, the way they were spoken of showed that they were in a mono-context. The kings themselves thought of themselves this way. And so there's this example that they found inscribed on tablets of stone. It's pretty famous if you are in the realm of biblical scholarship. Uh, and this is what it reads. So this is from 1620 BC. 
These are the words of son Mercilus, the great king, the king of the Hattie land, the valiant, the favorite of the storm god, and so on and so forth. Azirus was the grandfather of you, Duppy Tessib. So Duppy Tessib is the name of some random vassal in this ancient Near Eastern situation. And the king was coming to him and saying, I am your king. And what we find when we read this old document, literally inscribed on stone, is this, is that it contains, first, an identification of who is speaking. So he says here, these are the words of son Marcellus, the great king. Then we see on this stone tablet, this contract between a king and his people, we see a context of how he came to be their king. So he continues here. Aziris was the grandfather of you, Duppy Tessib. He rebelled against my father, but submitted again to my father. So this is, I mean, this is straight from a tablet from 1620 B.C. Then we see it in this tablet, and others like it, and other writings like it. But you, Duppy Tessib, must remain loyal towards the king of the Hattie land. So King Hattie said, you must remain loyal to me. Do not turn your eyes to anyone else. Your fathers presented tribute to Egypt. You shall not do that, exclamation point. So we see not only the identification, not only some context, but commands. And then we see in this document still, blessings and curses threatened. So I'm going to read from this document again. The words of the treaty and oath that are inscribed on this tablet should, Duppy Tessib, not honor these words. May the gods of this oath destroy Duppy Tessib together with his person, his wife, his son, his grandson, his house, his land, and everything that he owns. But if Duppy Tessib honors these words, may these gods protect him together with his person, wife, grandson, house, and country. They find all sorts of these documents that show a mono framework in terms of kingship and their people. And what do we find when we come to the Ten Commandments? This is Klein's kind of brilliance here as he marries archaeology and biblical studies. I am the Lord, your God. Identification. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What happened? The context. You shall have no other gods before me. Commandments. Blessings and curses. All throughout the Ten Commandments themselves. So as we see in the other commandments, honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land. There's kind of a promise there. Uh, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. So it's a, some negative command, visiting the iniquity of the fathers in the second commandment there. But even, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, later on, chapter 27 and 28, you have this massive list of blessings and curses And so what we see is that God, when he spoke these words in the Ten Commandments, he was speaking in a language that they understood back then. He took this covenant context of a a normal human king and people, and then God says, I am this king, and you are my people. And what that signaled to them was that he was not one God amongst many. He wasn't in a poly framework. He was in a mono framework. He was the only God, and no other God could be entered into a treaty with. And so one pastor, scholar, says this. First and foremost, this loyal obedience meant that Israel would worship Yahweh alone. To worship anyone else would be treason. And so you can imagine when the people of God or the nations start to treat a mono framework as a poly. Just like you would imagine how your wife or husband would feel if you began to treat them out of a mono context and into a poly 
context here. All right, that kind of, some on the face of it, might sound appealing. You could have a husband who is the family husband. Right? He's good with the kids. He spends a lot of time with them. He takes them often and gives you a break. But then you could have the providing husband. Right? If you had another husband who was really good at his job and you never had to worry about was there enough money or was his job stable, he was the providing husband. That's kind of his focus. He didn't need to be the family husband. He could just be the providing husband. And then, of course, you have the fun husband. He's the one that you thought you were dating in the beginning. He's the one that thinks about you more than his family or his job. He's the one that uh, shows you little appreciations that are unexpected throughout the day. He's the, the fun one. He wants to take you away somewhere fun. Imagine coming to your husband and saying, can you just be the fun husband, and can I go and have a providing husband and a family husband? Do you mind? Or vice versa, do you mind if I go find a fun wife? Or (laughs) would you, do you mind? Would you mind? Would they ever mind? Could you imagine saying that? I mean, it's funny, it is. But could you imagine actually saying that and the hurt and pain that a spouse would feel by mixing mono and poly, and can you imagine an infinite God and you mixing mono and poly? What he would feel and do. So here in this commandment, what does it mean? It means love God alone. It's exclusive. That's kind of what this commandment is. The others have talked about where to worship, when to worship. It's the fourth commandment. Sabbath, always. The third commandment, the heart of worship, to revere God, to honor God. The second commandment, ways to worship, not through images, but through his son. Here is the who of worship, God alone. So that's what this commandment means here. God demands exclusivity. So that was one, what does it mean? Number two, what does it mean for us today? Is this command relevant for you and I today? Because if you've grown up in the church or been around church long enough, you know that you're not supposed to worship other gods. Like you, you get the mono context here. You're not mixing. And when you think about this commandment to your neighbor, there aren't many in America today polytheists, at least not in the traditional term. You don't normally walk in and find a temple of multiple gods in people's homes. Unless, honestly, unless they come from the East or with Eastern religions, things like that. But here in America, it's mainly been Christianized or is atheist, atheistic, where there's not just a belief in one God among many, but no gods. So how, do you, how does this commandment apply when the culture that you're in isn't mainly polytheistic, but atheistic. How does this commandment apply? What does it mean to us today? Now, interestingly, back in the former times when this was written in a polytheistic context, you had people who believed in various gods. And some of the gods that we see in the Bible talked about are gods like Molech, uh, or Baal. Baal is a big one. So Baal, the word Baal means Lord. And so they had this kind of master head god. He would be Zeus, if you were uh, of the Greek or Roman side here. Zeus. So they had, for them, Baal. And he was uh, the god of providence, uh, multiple aspects. He had to be the Lord God. But then you had Asherah. So if you remember, the Israelites would set up Asherah poles. So she was represented by a tree, a carved tree, and it would be put in the high places. So all throughout the Old Testament, you would read uh, God commanding his people not to sacrifice to Molech, not to go to the high places to sacrifice to Asherah. So that's who the nations around God's people were then. Around us, people aren't sacrificing to Molech or to Asherah. Or are they? 
So I'm not the first to think or to see connections between the gods people worshipped back then and the gods that atheists, our culture, worships today. And you, the way you can think about this, this is cause and effect. Cause and effect, or religious God and religious actions that support that God. So what we see today is there is no religious God on the top there. The actions uh, that go to a religious God, maybe, are there. Back then you saw the religious God and the actions that supported it. So one of the actions of Molech was dedicating all that you had, the best that you had, to finances for the outcome that you wanted. You would dedicate what you had, the best of what you had to this God in hopes that your crops would be good or that you would have a family if you're dedicating to Asherah. Here, though, what scholars have begun to notice is this. They, there supposedly is no God above the atheistic American culture. But when they look around, they still see aspects of worship, actions of worship, so to speak. So it would be like walking into a different country and asking them, do they celebrate Christmas? And they might call it a different name, but you see a Christmas tree and they see presents there. It's like, oh, you don't call it Christmas. I see, I see. You call it something else in your language. But yeah, you celebrate Christmas. Well, what these people have done is they've seen, they've walked into this atheistic culture and they've seen, hey, you have a tree and you have presents, but you say you have no God. But you're still doing the worship actions of God. And interestingly, some of those actions with at least the God of Molech is the sacrificing of children. The sacrificing of children so that your life can go better. So that something will happen to you. So people don't sacrifice their children today to Molech. And when you read the descriptions of Molech and how that sacrifice was carried out through the fire, it's pretty intense and graphic. So you look back then at the polytheists and you say, man, they would put their child there in hopes that something good would happen. But then you look over here and you see what people would do to the children in order that they might have a more prosperous life. Maybe back then they didn't want to give their children up, but they felt like they had no choice in order to live. People are looking at today at the actions and they see they may not want to give their children up, but they feel like they have no choice. Likewise, in Asherah worship, the main aspect of that was not sacrificing children, but it was sexual. So it was literally an act of worship to go and have sex in a temple. For some of you, that might be appealing. Today, though, we see the worship of sexuality. We see the same religious actions of putting sexuality above everything else in pursuit of a good outcome. And as some have noted, a lot of this around sex and gender isn't based on science like it's claimed. There's no science behind an internal and an external sense of sexuality. There's, there, it's not provable. How can you prove that someone feels sexually one way or another? They have to tell you. You have to take it on faith. And so they've noted the faith aspects of the worship of sexuality and the prioritization of it above all else. And so what we see in our culture today is even though there's no explicit polytheism, there's atheism on the surface, the actions are pretty similar. And so it makes you ask the question, do we actually live in a polytheistic context? It looks different, it goes by a different name, but it seems to be a polytheistic context. Now we know that there's not actual other gods. They know that too. So Paul even says in 1 Corinthians chapter eight, 
He's talking about eating food offered to idols. And he says this, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there's no God but one. Although there are so-called gods in heaven and on earth, so he says, even though we use the name gods, yet for us, we know there's only one God and Father from whom are all things and for whom all exist and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So he's saying, even though we live in a polytheistic world that calls other things gods, we know that there are no other gods, but there's one. So when we read this commandment today and see how to apply it, what it means today, we see that we actually do live in a polytheistic world. And the need for monotheism, and especially Christian theism, is just as applicable today as it was back then. So it's interesting that Paul here links the oneness of God from this commandment. He quotes from Deuteronomy with the worship of Jesus Christ. That should be confusing to you at least a little bit, especially if you come from a Jewish background. You would say, yes, if you claim the oneness of God, how can you worship Jesus Christ? And yet that's exactly what we're commanded to do. Jesus Christ comes in and shows the power of God in creation, in healing, in walking on water. He shows the same powerful actions of God. People worship him, and he doesn't turn them away. When you read the book of Revelation, John begins to worship this angel, and the angel says, stop, don't worship me. I'm a a messenger like you are. Worship God alone. People come to worship Jesus, and he says, thank you. Here, what we see and what Christians throughout the centuries have seen is that Jesus doesn't just come as another God. Somehow and in some way, he comes as God. And so the answer that God gives to a polytheistic world is not to set up an idol. It's not to... Just give in to the temptation. Like, my people need to worship multiple things. They need to go different places for different needs. He doesn't give in to that. He instead sends himself. He sends his son. Now, it is confusing. The Trinity is unlike anything else in this world. And yet, logically, it makes sense. It's confusing, but it's not illogical. And so what God says, what Jesus says, what here Paul says, for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, one Baal, one Master, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are are all things and through whom we exist. What this commandment, this first commandment is calling us to is not just to worship God alone, but in light of the New Testament, to worship Jesus Christ alone. To worship the Father through the Son for all of the mystery that that has around it. To worship Jesus Christ. And if you know anything about Jesus Christ, it becomes more doable. Right? Just like we read from Duppy Tessa, if you are, if you apply a poly worldview to a mono relationship, he says, may the gods of this curse you. May you be destroyed. Here, even though you and I go to many other things first before going to God, we ought to be destroyed, like Duppy Tessip. We ought to be divorced because we've gone to our marriage partner and said, can I go to someone else to be the fun God? Can I go to someone else to be the God who provides for me when I need it? Can I go to someone else to be the God that answers prayer? Maybe it's medicine, maybe it's business, you name it. We can make anything into a God. But instead of condemning us 
the God himself stands in our place. And so when the commandment comes to you to worship God alone, to worship Jesus Christ alone, it actually changes from this stifling, forced commandment, and it becomes a desire from the heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being Lord and for standing in my place, for taking my covenant-breaking sins upon yourself. Even though you were faithful, even though you never bowed down, Jesus, you deserve my worship. I want to love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength alone. So that's, how this, that's what this first commandment means. We, we know what it means. We see what it means for us. And so I just want to end briefly with this. What does it mean to live in light of the first commandment? Practically. I want to leave you with some practical steps here. So R.C. Sproul was a PCA pastor, and he had this theme, this theme idea for his life and his ministry, and it was this, Coram Deo, Coram Deo. That's literally from this verse. The word, it's Latin, Coram Deo, means before God. So I want you to look at this verse in Exodus 20. Maybe your translation will say it. In this verse here, we saw what it means to look at the exclusive, exclusivity part. You shall have no other gods. But the last part is key. It says before me. In the Hebrew, if you were to translate it really woodenly, it would say before my face. The image given here is that God is watching us. He has his face here. Just like my face, you are all before my face right now. God is saying, you shall have no other gods before my face. And it gives this quorum Deo meaning, living before God. And so what he says this, to live before the face of God, quorum Deo, is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and to the glory of God. Or put simply, to live quorum Deo is to act that we are, like we are under the gaze of God. To understand that whatever we're doing and wherever we're doing it, he is there. We are before his face. It's living as if there's a God watching you because he says here in this verse, you are. You are before me always. So how do we practically live in a first commandment quorum Deo before the face of God way? The first is this, a, a life marked by purposefulness. Purposefulness, and this is from Sproul here. He says, the Christian who compartmentalizes his life into a religious side and a non-religious side is betraying this idea that all of life is before God's face. So what he says is this. This means that whatever you do with your time outside of church, outside of reading the Bible, you need to see as a part of living under the face of God, living before the face of God. This means when you go to work, you're there doing something religious. You're there carrying out a calling or a vocation to you by God. So work for the glory of God. You might not do anything differently, but you'll do it for a different reason. And that matters to God. So Sproul says this, this means that if a person fulfills his calling as a steel maker, an attorney, or a homemaker, if you do that quorum Deo before the face of God, then that person is acting every bit as religiously as an evangelist who fulfills his vocation. It means that the King David was as religious when he obeyed God's call to be a shepherd as he was when he was called to be a king. It means that Jesus was every bit as religious when he worked in his father's carpenter shop as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus always lived before the face of his father. When we have a relationship with Jesus, it means that we have the same loving gaze of our father. So what that means practically, one thing is a life marked by purposefulness. We do things, as the commandment says, 
or as Paul says, rather. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. A life marked by purposefulness, a life marked by prayer. Against the idea of a supermarket mentality, of going to all these other places first, what it looks like to live in a mono mentality where God and Christ alone are worshipped is this. If God is the source of everything, then we'll go to him first. We'll go to him first. And what it means to go to him first is primarily through prayer. So when I need something, my first impulse isn't to go to my God of Amazon and to get it. My impulse, Daniel, should be to go to my God in prayer and then go to Amazon. <laughs> but, go, but maybe in going to my, uh, to my God who provides, maybe he provides another way and I don't need to go to Amazon. Or maybe he tells me I'm okay with what I have and I don't need to go to this other place. Or maybe I still need to go to Amazon, but and I, when I go in prayer first, everything changes because I'm living under the face of God. Life changes, fertility infertility, job changes. When you need things, instead of the supermarket mentality, we go first to God. He might provide through means, but we go first to God. Comfort, joy, happiness, entertainment, not first Netflix, Facebook, TikTok, sports, but prayer. So a life, quorum Deo, under the face of God, will be purposeful and prayerful. That's what this first commandment means. That's what it means for us, and that's how to live a life, quorum Deo. So would you pray with me to our one God? Lord God, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Thank you that you now look upon us with love because of your son, Jesus. Father, I pray for each person here that you would lead them in love to you through the worship of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, for the challenging aspects of the Trinity, I pray that you would give peace and clarity and trust. Father, I pray that you would lead us into a life under your face and that we would flourish because of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we sing this next song to our Lord?